It's great to get to introduce Zephyr Teachout, who graduated from the law school in 1999. Um, uh, I'm to thank the uh, American Constitution Society chapter um, and the library, which are co-sponsoring this event along with the program in public law. Um, Zephyr is this year's um, library alumni speaker. Uh, and if I, if I were just to tell you about Zephyr Teach Out, mm. I'm not sure you would believe me. Um, so I'll just run through a few of the basic background facts. Um, she appeared on The Daily Show last year. And if you want to see Jon Stewart having a huge, beautiful, ethical, and political and intellectual crush on a Daily Show guest, watch the extended portion of that interview. Um, you may have heard that she ran for governor in New York um, against an incumbent with the best known political name in the state, Andrew Cuomo, who outspent her 40 to 1. Um, and she got over a third of the vote in a last minute insurgent campaign. Thank you. Um, you may not know that when the Supreme Court decided uh, the Citizens United opinion in 2010, holding that corporations can, give, um, can spend unlimited amounts in support of candidates, um, both the Scalia concurrence and the lead dissent by Justice Stevens cited Zephyr's first major piece of scholarship when she was still just a baby professor. Um, and on the topic, uh, the senator on the topic that she's going to be talking about today, um, because Zephyr is a very serious scholar of political corruption, um, which is a constitutionally central concept right now, because the Supreme Court, in dealing with the question of how and how far you can turn economic power or wealth into political power by spending on campaigns, um, has held that because spending money is a form of speech, there's only one reason that's strong enough to authorize the government to limit spending, and that is to prevent corruption. Um, when Zephyr got wind of that as a baby professor, she went back and read the founding era and early republic treatments of politics and the constitutional structure. And she realized that they were obsessed with corruption, but that they meant something very different by it than what the Supreme Court means, and something that might, if we took it seriously, lead to a very different conclusion about the role of money in politics and the relation between economic inequality on the one hand and political equality in a democratic society on the other hand. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, and you're really not going to believe me, but it's true, uh, you may have heard that the Democrats have won the last two presidential elections partly because of a major structural advantage in internet-based strategy and technology um, that emerged in the Howard Dean campaign in 2004, who of course didn't ultimately win, and then uh, dominated in Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 and 2012. Zephyr Teachout, working for Howard Dean's campaign, actually inaugurated that internet strategy and has a good claim to be the parent of that form of organizing, which is totally fitting because Zephyr is, when you come down to it, an expert on the relationship between organized people on the one hand, which is democracy, and organized money on the other hand, which has a very prominent role in our democracy, but as a way of organizing things is something other than democracy. Um, so she's had an amazing few years. Um, the format of what we're going to do is that Zephyr uh, will talk to you for something on the order of 15 minutes. Um, then she and I are going to have a discussion. I'm going to prompt her with a few questions and intersperse those with questions from the audience so we can get a feel for what's on your mind, what you want to hear from her about. Um, and of course, particularly where you have an alumna here, you may be thinking about your own future decisions and the kind of thing you can learn from someone who came through um, here and has gone on to do such interesting things. So um, 
have, have those sorts of questions as well as questions about constitutional doctrine and politics in mind. Um, and please welcome Zephyr. It's so exciting to have her here. Thank you. You know, I, the shorter version of uh, what Jed just said is the Elizabeth Bishop poem, The Art of Losing. I lost the Constitution and Citizens United, Howard Dean's campaign, a gubernatorial campaign, so I'm just looking for the next big loss. Mm -hmm. I am um, overwhelmingly grateful for so many um, people and institutions in this room. I am grateful for Duke Law School for letting me in. I believe it was the only law school that accepted me. I only applied to two, but. <laughs> I am incredibly grateful uh, for the education that I got here and um, grateful for uh, people like Jed and uh, Professor Boyle um, who read and were, Jamie, <laughs> I didn't want to undermine your dignity. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, and then there's Ralph, oh, sorry, <laughs> Ralph and Neil, no, I, uh, who really helped with formulating these ideas. I'm incredibly excited and honored to be a speaker for the library um, because I uh, relied heavily on the library and the library's research, as Jennifer can tell you, um, in doing this um, book. I'm grateful to ACS. I'm incredibly grateful to the program in public law. And um, I really look forward to hearing your questions and conversations. So I am a um, Langston Hughes patriot. Um, I don't know if you remember this great poem he has about let America be America again. Let it be the land the dreamers dreamed. America was never America to me. And he goes on to say, you know, out of the rape and ruin of our gangster death, um, I, I promise you this, America will be. So the Langston Hughes model here is that we have never had a golden age, but that there are extra, extraordinarily powerful things in our history that we should nonetheless learn from and aspire to perfect. So I set out to understand a history of what corruption has meant in American law, not with a claim that there was ever a non-corrupt era or a time at which we'd solved this great puzzle of how corruption and law interact, but rather with the idea that there's extraordinary wisdom in the past in ways that we should think about these core concepts of corruption and democracy. So right now, we, um, there are these central fights around this word and concept of corruption. There's three basic fights. One is a fight about what corruption means. Just think about it for a second. If you were on a jury and somebody said, uh, he is guilty if he corruptly gave this gift, what's your instinct in terms of what corruptly means there? So one is what corruption or corruptly means. Another fight is how important is it? Is this a sort of essential problem in American democracy or is it a relatively trivial problem? And then the third fight is assuming that it exists, uh, what should we do about it? What are the kinds of um, responses you could have to it? The fight about what corruption means, and, and all of these three fights are recently, um, I think, distorted by the fact that the Supreme Court has made the definition of corruption central to its own jurisprudence. So in 1976 in Buckley versus Vallejo, and ever since then, the Supreme Court has basically said that um, those laws which implicate political speech, defined as including spending money on speech, but we'll put that aside, um, if they implicate or threaten political speech, they can only be passed if they serve an interest of fighting corruption. So suddenly it becomes incredibly important what corruption means and all of these fights become incredibly important. Broadly, there are, I mean, there's so many different um, angles on what corruption means, but I'm just gonna introduce a few. Uh, one set of people argue that corruption is explicit quid pro quo exchange. Another related category of people argue that corruption 
is that which is against the law in our criminal bribery statutes. They rarely explicitly argue that, but the Supreme Court in McCutcheon versus FEC cites to a criminal law bribery statute to define corruption. So it's sort of referring to what we have passed to be uh, uh, corrupt. Another category, Larry Lessig argues that corruption exists when there's inappropriate dependencies, when those either structural or person, uh, individuals have inappropriate dependencies. Another group of people argue that corruption is basically not a meaningful concept, it's just inequality in disguise. So when we talk about corruption, what we're really saying is we have an inequality problem. So we say there's corruption in Congress, what we're really saying is not enough, uh, there's unequal access. My argument is that, um, you know, just, just sort of like Aristotle, that's my source. <laughs> Now, my argument does fall in the Aristotelian Montesquieu tradition, which is that corruption is uh, overlaps with all of those, but is not defined by any of those. Rather, corruption is when those with public power use it for private or selfish or narrow ends. And so that means the definition of corruption, at least on the personal level, you know, an institution is corrupt when the institution serves private ends. An uh, act is corrupt when that act the exercise of public power serves private and narrow ends, and a person is corrupt when they, in the exercise of public power, serve private or narrow ends. What, what that means is that to understand whether a person or act is corrupt, you actually have to know something about their soul. You have to know something about why they are doing it, what the underlying motivation is. This has a real impact on what you then think the right solution to corruption problems is. Because if you think that corruption is fundamentally about selfish behavior, it actually makes a very poor fit with criminal law statutes which are designed to punish those who are corrupt. Because criminal law does a pretty bad job of figuring out what was in your heart when you passed that law, or what was in your heart when you um, uh, you know, push for that regulatory exception. Does that make sense? Because if the question is, were you doing it for selfish, narrow reasons, then the jury has to sort of figure out the deep underlying unspoken motivations. What it means instead is that the best kind of response to corruption in political society is structural to make it less likely that one is tempted to serve narrow or private ends and make it more likely that one can serve public uh, broad ends. So of course then, this depends on a theory of the person because the story of corruption that I've just told you assumes that people are capable of both being selfish and being public oriented. Does that make sense? That corruption as one uh, actually wonderful Duke a scholar uh, has said, it's not that, uh, we're talking about Hobbes, it's not that Hobbes didn't um, believe in corruption, it's that it didn't make any sense to him because his view of the person was so egotistical, ego-focused, that the idea that one could be public-oriented and veer away from that public orientation to private orientation was simply incoherent. So anyway, this is a, uh, we're doing a 10-minute, you know, Shakespeare in 30 seconds of... <laughs> Um, this is the, this, these are the kinds of fight we're having. And what's at stake right now are two things. One, one thing that's at stake is uh, what the Supreme Court will do. So I initially wrote this book, Corruption in America, as really a letter to the Supreme Court, a letter to Justice Kennedy and to Justice Scalia, saying, um, here's another view of corruption that is not captured in your current jurisprudence, and guess what? This view is reflected in almost all of American history up through 1976. I provide evidence in the book that during the Constitutional Convention, they talked about corruption all the time, more than almost any other topic. They ran almost every clause in the Constitution through the ringer of, would it be more or less likely to lead to this kind of self-serving behavior? And then show that this idea of corruption really persists again through the 1970s in different forms. And to be clear, there's a sort of non, um, there's, a, there's always a fundamental puzzle about how corruption and law fit together. There are great legal questions around corruption and law, like if 50% of the North Carolina legislature has a private interest in passing a law, is that law so corrupt as to not be a law? Was that process so corrupting that it no longer is a law? That's a question the courts have gone back and forth on at different times. It, 
energized the country around the Yazoo land scandal because uh, all of the lawmakers in Georgia in the early uh, 19th century had been bribed to, get, to give away land. And the question was, was that land giveaway because there was bribery so corrupt that the land giveaway was not a law? Tough question, right? Justice Marshall is a great case, the only case that I know of where they had to pause oral argument because um, the lawyer for Georgia was so drunk that he had to sober up. <laughs> Georgia did not win. <laughs> uh, Justice Marshall, who himself had been a land speculator, ends up saying, we can't actually pass judgment on whether or not a law is corrupt or not, because how many people would need to have been bribed to make it a corrupt law? Would it be all 50%? Is it just one? And it's a misfortune that corruption has crept into our early republic, but we can't do anything about it. There's another great puzzle that we haven't been grappling with for a long time, I think because both liberals and conservatives avoid it for different reasons, which is the law of lobbying. So for the plurality of our history, lobbying was against the public policy of the United States. You know, and from contracts law, that there's some things you can own but not sell. Um, I, I was lucky enough to see uh, Professor Boyle teach um, the great case uh, about the spleen, where you, has anybody taken his class on that? Yes. Uh, and in that, in that <laughs> maybe it's the whole semester. <laughs> but, um, but as you might remember from that case, there are things that you can own but not sell. You know, certain organ sex in New York Metro cards. Um, <laughs> Well, lobbying was one of those things that was seen as a non-vendable. You could try to influence people, but not sell that influence. Personal influence was a non-vendable. And it was so much the part of hundreds and hundreds, thousands of cases around the country that lobbying wasn't something, the, the petitioning government wasn't something you could sell, that a case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court at one point. And uh, the Supreme Court, there's an old man who's hired a lawyer. A lawyer gets the money that he's owed back from Congress. And the old man uh, and lawyer asks for the money for the work he's done. And the old man's like, I'm not going to pay you. That was a corrupt contract to lobby. Um, the Supreme Court reviewing the case says, yeah, well, you know, there's no evidence of bribery or anything here. But if we allow this old man to hire this lawyer as a lobbyist, well, the great corporations of our day will all hire adventurers and bring their cases in front of the state houses of the country, and every right-thinking man would call that corrupt. So lobbying was sort of fundamentally, the sale of personal influence was seen as fundamentally corrupt for a long time. Um, anyway, you can see these sort of interesting puzzles of how law and corruption fit together. Corruption is a nice word for dinner conversations and a hard word for law. Um, that hardness, I argue, should not mean that we run away from it. And really, since 1976, I think we've been running away from a lot of the hard questions around corruption. Um, the, those on the left tend to um, prefer to argue that corruption is just an inequality concern, that there, is, there isn't anything really there besides concerns about inequality when we're concerned about corruption. And those on the right, again, these are broad characterizations, tend to say corruption is just quid pro quo bribery. I, it's a, it's a side, but it's an important side to me. Quid pro quo doesn't enter the um, bribery or corruption lexicon until the 1970s. So quid pro quo, there's no historical basis. It's a Latin term, and I think that Latin makes it sound precise. You know, like... And old. It's, what? And old. And old, as if it's been around for a long time. Well, it has been around for a long time in contract law, referring to the relative equality of exchange, not in um, a criminal... Um, uh, and not in criminal law, and actually there's an enormous amount of debate about what constitutes quid pro quo. So even though there's an emotional experience of solidity around the language quid pro quo, there's not actual solidity in the case law, as Professor <laughs> Sarah knows very well. Um, so I argue that we should not run away from that complexity and in fact embrace this foundational principle that one of the jobs of a democratic society is to make corruption less likely. Maybe that sounds like a modest effort. I don't think we can get rid of corruption. I don't think people will ever stop being self-serving. But I do think that we carry within ourselves extraordinary capacities for public service and extraordinary capacities for selfishness. And it is the job of law to encourage those structures that make it easier to serve the public 
as opposed to to serve ourselves, our friends and family. So one of the purposes of this argument then is to the court, but the other purpose of the argument is to ourselves as a, as a public, as a citizenry. Because I believe that the, there's been almost a trickle-down effect of a kind of, um, uh, a trickle-down effect of an ideology that really comes from the law and economics movement, an ideology that people are egotistical in our society as a whole. So that we have come to, in many ways, accept ourselves as consumers, as profit maximizers, and see the person, and therefore those in public office, as necessarily out for themselves and out for their friends. And I think that way of seeing the world actually limits our own imagination in terms of what we could do publicly, and arguably, I think, ends up making um, government, self-government, democracy itself, very difficult to do. Montesquieu, who was seen as the fountainhead, um, the, the authority to which everybody turned in the Constitutional Convention, said that, you know, we know we have a problem with democracy when people wait patiently for their hire. Think about that phrase, wait patiently for their hire, when people no longer see themselves as active public citizens, but just waiting to get theirs, waiting to get hired, waiting to get their appointment. Um, and so his claim, and actually the claim that you see throughout the um, Constitutional Convention, is that not only is this a, a, a problem, it is actually foundational that we build a society in which we encourage public virtue and discourage corruption. In fact, it's naive to think that you can have self-government or democracy without the cultivation of that kind of public orientation. So I look forward to the conversation. And uh, thank you for uh, welcoming me. Can I stand? Wow. Or? Um, or we can both stand. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Um, so, this, I, um, I never I, got a debate with uh, Andrew Cuomo, so this is like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll try to look more like a scary, freeze-dried robot. <laughs> <laughs> Which, um, it's, hard, it's hard. I didn't practice in front of a mirror. Um, so I have a, a pair of linked questions. And one's really conceptual, and one's really practical. So the heart of the argument, which is such a powerful one, is that corruption has to do with the orientation of the people in the political community, from citizens all the way up to legislators. Are you thinking about yourself and your own next economic move? Or are you thinking about some broader idea of the public interest? Orientation in like a strict sense, which way are you facing? Yeah. Are you facing like your own bottom line or some sort of common conception? And then you say, this is exactly right. That's not the kind of thing the law can regulate. It's not good at it, and it's also not how we work in a liberal society. And in fact, even the language of corruption puts some people off because it feels moralizing and antique. Um, so you make this move, which is exactly right, which is to say we need to create an institutional ecosystem where people are more likely to be thinking about the kinds of things we want them to be thinking about, arguing about ideas of the public good rather than thinking about where they're going to get there. Um, so the really concrete question is just to sort of nail down some of what you said. What can law learn about this in Supreme Court doctrine, in legislative design? What are the key elements of the institutional ecosystem we ought to be building? And the second, the conceptual one is this. So corruption as a concept implies that the thing that's corrupt is messed up or contaminated. It's not in its pure form. So to know whether something like political practice is corrupt, you have to know what it, you have to have some idea of what it looks like when it's not, right? Um, so what's the kind of, tell us a little more about the positive conception of a public good, a public regarding attitude. Yeah. Because the cynical people you're talking about will just say, well, the unions call the public good what they like, and the Corporations call it what they like, and the churches call it what they like, and the law professors call it what they like. But yeah, I'm going to start with the second um, because I, I do think it's important. 
I actually think that um, those who claim that politicians are purely private serving have very little experience of politics. Um, that, um, in, in fact, one of the arguments in the book is that we have had too few politicians on the court recently, and the absence of politicians correlates pretty well with when the court doesn't take corruption that seriously and seems to have a diminished view of politics, to see all of politics as corrupt. So I think instead you have to think of your own experiences. So maybe the idealized form might be a jury. Has anybody been on a jury? Wow, relatively few. So in a jury, it's not that you're not thinking about when you want to get home or other things, but fundamentally, the work in the room is a question about what happened in this particular instance. And there is a group of people who come together and ask each other that question. And I think most of the time, with exceptions, take that relatively seriously. They, they take their task to be uh, figuring out what happened and, and you know, whether it's guilt or innocence or depending on what's the, what the question is in the jury. And we actually accept that pretty broadly. We don't tend to worry that in the jury room, people are gonna be using that case in order to further their own private ends. So that's sort of perhaps the most ideal form. But then take something that may be more normal to you, whether it's a faculty meeting or a meeting with a ACS group what you might see is a real mix of motivations. So it's a much more complicated, really, story of the person. Because some people might be in there to try to get something for themselves. Um, some people might be in there for ambition, uh, to get fame. Some people might be in there because they have an ideological uh, dogma that they're trying to push. There's a whole range of different kinds of, of motivations that come into these kinds of meetings. And we accept that. That feels normal to us. But it actually would be very weird, and I think somewhat toxic, if you were in a meeting and everybody in that meeting was entirely focused on their own angle. So I'd say something similar happens in political environments and political conversations. There's an enormous blend. But what has become deeply toxic is that our current system, so then this actually blends into your first mm -hmm. question, is that our current system trains and makes your job um, 30 to 70 percent of Congress members' time is now fundraising. So it makes your job not to be in that meeting bringing, you know, trying to orient yourself towards the public, bringing all that you bring, but your job is to serve narrow private ends. And so that our current practical, um, I, I, does, that, does that help answer your first question? Is just to, to first think of what you know about people in your own life. Another analogy that I use in the book is one um, which again also actually goes back to Aristotle when talking about corruption, is the uh, thinking about the relationship to the public like the relationship to, the, to a family member. Um, maybe your daughter, maybe a niece, uh, maybe a distant family member, where we actually take it for granted that people are quite capable of being oriented towards another in a quasi-selfless way, where they're just not thinking. They are ident so deeply identifying with that other that they care about them. And that's the kind of... Um, psychological possibility that I think it is the law's, law's job to encourage, that we think about the public and talk about the public and engage in the public in the way that we think and talk about uh, other people that we, we, we're not going to gain anything by them doing well. I just, the first claim is that psychologically possible. So it's less of a conceptual claim really than a claim about human personality. Um, and then what we should do is there's one thing we should just stop doing. We should stop having private financing of campaigns. So the current model of um, private financing of campaigns um, basically takes a person with all these various possibilities inside her, her and says, your job every day is to be a sycophant to the wealthiest people in world history, to identify them, to identify their interests, to be nice to them, and to make them give you $2,000. And that is your job. That is your um, that is your work. And so we are then training a kind of subservience um, to a handful of people that I think is really toxic to the kind of training that orients you towards the public good. So one is stop private financing campaigns. I wish there was another alternative, but the alternative to private financing of campaigns is public financing of campaigns. So I think we should move to a, a public financing of campaigns model. I, when I was running for office, this was very clear to me that um, my days would have been entirely different in a public financing model. Instead of sitting with somebody, I had to, the general advice was 40 hours a week and fundraising. 
Um, so instead of sitting in a room for 40 hours a week and then in the evenings and mornings meeting with humans, my job was, um, uh, my job would have been meeting with as many people as possible so I could show a baseline of support so I could get enough money to, to run for office. So it would then take that instinct I have to, to listen to people, I have these different instincts, and make that my job. And so then my job becomes listening, my job becomes very broad. So that's one thing. The other thing which I really think is a lot harder is um, this lobbying um, business. Because right now, so many um, state houses and Washington are socially overrun by lobbyists. So that you're in a social context in which people have sold private influence, sold their ability to influence. So you're in a social context in which people are not using public language in an honest way. Um, and I actually think that's a lot harder to deal with. My own solution is uh, break up all the big companies. Um, and, but seriously, because one of the, you see that um, big companies can solve collective action problems easier and pay for lobbying more. In fact, you see almost all the lobbying coming from relatively well capitalized and relatively concentrated industries. So I actually think that one of the biggest structural reforms we should make is uh, decentralizing economic power. And I, I don't think public financing alone will solve it. I think we need to do both. Let's see if we have a question. Yeah, Tyler Curtin. I have a question about um, institutionalization of procedures that mean to strip away motives from actions. So if you think of voting, say, on a committee <coughs> or voting at large, um, and you walk into a voting booth and you pull a lever, there's no ironic voting. Like, you can't go in and say, I'm You don't know some of my friends. Uh, like, oh, no. I, I'm voting for this uh, candidate that I don't like, ironically. Right. And in fact, if you've got a committee, and let's say they're voting on a, an environmental law, and uh, most of them think that humans have inherited the earth and can do with it what they please, or most of them think that that's true, it's divinity, but they're stewards. But they don't have to say anything. All they have to vote is up or down, let's say, on a law. How does, what is the scope of corruption? Is it the level of the individual? Does one have to know motives in a, in a, in a system in which procedures mean to strip out motives? All you have is outcomes, yes. right? Yes, so I think that it is both present and unknowable. Um, I mean, of course, one can confess I was corrupt in this act, but that I actually think the heart of the meaning is not something that one can know. And it's good that institutions try to strip that out. It's also that the institution, I, I, or that it's good to have institutions that are not testing for corruption. I just don't think that is the job of institutions, is to test in this individual act, is it corrupt or not. I think the job of institutions and language is to make one more likely to go into that private binary choice, trying to answer what is best for the community that I have obligations to. So it's a consequential understanding of the action and it's what follows rather than an understanding of the character of the one who makes the choice. No, no, I think the understanding of the character is, is the key. Huh. Does that make sense? And this yeah. is where I, I, yeah. I disagree with almost everybody hmm. who writes in this area. Um, who I think is looking for some other way to understand what is corrupt. Let's get one from a student. Yeah. Um, so if we move to the public financing of campaigns uh, model, how, how, how do you separate money from free speech? Could I contribute money to a campaign or to a, a, a commercial that represented an idea that I liked? Um, in, in what sense, what is the scope of free speech and how do you separate money from free speech? Um, so I think those are two different questions. I, I, so in a public financing model, um, the state either matches small donations or gives a lump sum to candidates who show they have a fair amount of support. Does that make sense? So is that the... I donate money to a commercial that was just representing an idea. So um, right now, under the Supreme Court doctrine, you can have public financing of elections and we cannot limit your donating in any other area. So you, those are compatible. That, that makes sense. So you can have two, there's two different models. One is that you have public financing with the existing system, and the other is that you have public financing and then also different limits on contributions, limits on spending. Does that make sense? So, so I, you could be asking me, what does the court think, or what do I think, or what do, what's the utopia, or 
how can you limit my ability to spend money on campaigns that are limiting my free speech? So I think that um, the goal of, I, I guess I don't think it's a real infringement. So this is not something the book is as much about. Um, but I don't think that, uh, li uh, depending on what the limits are, um, I don't think that certain limits on spending politically are a serious infringement of what I see to be the core values behind the First Amendment. Um, I think at some point it becomes that. So what I actually think is it's a lot trickier than what the court wants to acknowledge, which is that you have to engage in real questions about uh, institutional effects. And, and take it one level further, I think that the fight against corruption is always whack-a-mole. That there's always going to be efforts to develop, uh, you know, the, what Jed and I were talking about sociopaths the other day. There's always going to be those in society who will identify the weaknesses in a system and figure out ways that self-interest can take over. And what that means is that legislatures need to be relatively free to bring up new institutional responses to new institutional problems. Um, because at one point, it may be that lobbying is the big threat. At another point, lobbying may be a totally trivial threat. And the real threat is in campaign contributions. At one point, campaign contributions may not be that important. And because it's this constantly changing game, the Supreme Court's shackling of legislatures by saying there's only a few things that we call corrupt, and, there's only, and therefore there are only a few things that you can use to fight it, is itself one of the most damaging parts of what they're doing. So I would get, have a lot more deference to legislatures with some real concern about legislatures being incumbent protecting. Does that make sense? Michael. Oh. In, thank you for coming. Forgive me. Uh, in 2009, I volunteered and worked for a little bit for Cuomo, largely on the strength. <laughs> so did of, I. Largely, I did. Yeah. Largely on the strength of uh, his father's reputation. Uh, and in 2013, I voted for you in the primary because uh, for many well, reasons. But a year before I ran. That's awesome. Sorry. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> thank uh, you. Sorry. About uh, law school. I've got a lot on my mind. Uh, but uh, largely because he didn't support the Fair Elections Act in New York. Yeah, that's a big reason why I ran as well. And when I was looking at your campaign, I was wondering, how is she doing this? How, 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 did, how did you go from being a professor to ru uh, running in politics? I, I went to law school, largely learned about the law to one day hopefully maybe be a legislator. That's what I was very interested in. And you know, last summer I talked to some political, uh, political operatives, and they asked me one thing and one thing only when I asked how do I run for office, and they said, can you raise $100,000 for a state assembly seat? And, and I'll, I can't even raise $5,000. You know, I've tried for a leukemia run that I wanted to do. And, <laughs> you know, you, how, how could I possibly raise that much money? And, and how did you, how are you able to do that in, in, that, in, your, in your own capacity with, without having to beg corporations and the wealthy to donate money to your campaign? Um, I was able to do it for a few for a few different reasons. One is I initially got support of the Working Families Party, which gave me press attention. And then when the Working Families Party no longer supported me, I had still entered the press arena. And a lot of the reasons you have to raise money is to get press attention. But having said that, I had about $8,000 when I decided to run. And the working theory was that there was a chance that Andrew Cuomo would get indicted. It's <laughs> um, serious. And that there should be a, another candidate in the race so that if he got indicted, we would have a serious Democratic candidate. And so we've put the odds of that about 5 to 8 percent and then waited for him to make mistakes. And um, he made some very serious mistakes, which helped me fundraise. And then I also fundraised the first uh, 50 or $60,000 off of friends of mine from college. I went to Yale, many of whom don't agree with me politically. So at the same time, and then we end up raising $880,000. A lot of the average contribution was $57. It was a lot of media attention. But um, I do not, unlike some people, see my campaign as proof that anybody can run because uh, I was relying on a social network of people who were more anti-union than I was, um, for example, um, who just gave money to me because they had so much and were friends. So I don't want to use that as proof that the system works. I actually think the system does not work. However, it is proof that those in power can make mistakes, so you should at least be ready for those mistakes to happen, um, and that people are far more foolish than we um, give them credit for. 
it seems like there's sort of two issues. There's the private financing of elections, and there's also the Citizens United issue and the fact yeah. that corporations can um, contribute whatever they want to super PACs. So my question is, um, if we do move to a public finance system and don't um, overturn Citizens United, what sort of impact would that have? without having um, limits on... If I could wave my wand and do one of two things, overturn Citizens United or have public financing in every election in the country, I would have public financing in every election of the country. Because even before Citizens United, we had a system of radical dependence on the wealthy uh, 1%. They weren't using it in the same ways. And it was our job to um, you know, seek after these big whales. Um, so what you see in New York City is that the cost of what it takes to run a good campaign has gone up because of Citizens United, which means a good public financing model actually needs to fund at higher levels than it did eight years ago. Does that make sense? So I think it changes the public financing um, system. It doesn't, uh, there's still serious problems with Citizens United outside spending. And what you see happening is that campaigns are orienting themselves more and more towards getting the attention of outside spenders. So it's not, it's not, you're not, it's your, not your job to dial for dollars, but it's your job to look after the big fish. Like, what is it that Tom Steyer wants? You know, so you may not have a conversation with Tom Steyer, but you're still orienting yourself towards the want of a private interest. And so I actually think we still need to work on, I mean, I'm, a, I'm interested in court packing and um, other ways of, of challenging this current court's power because I think our democracy is on fire in a very serious way. But I still think we could do a lot. We would we'd change the job. The job right now, I mean, the job of being a, uh, I say this with great respect to the, all the deans, uh, the dean of a law school, the head of a nonprofit or a um, politician, right now we have, we've chosen our leaders are all people who are doing sales all the time. And you ask why people don't vote. It's very, it's less inspiring to be following somebody around who feels like a salesperson than somebody who feels like a leader. So it's having these other effects on our political society. And um, if we can change, at least change the job from being a salesperson to being uh, somebody who's engaging with the public, I think that would be so dramatic and so radical that uh, that's what I'd hope for. Um, I want to, in a second, come back to the audience, but I think particularly, as I said before, as an alumna of the school, you could give people something by talking about how, you, how you've approached major decisions in your life. Yeah. Lawyers are professionally cautious, um, and you are not temperamentally cautious. Um, yeah. Um, well, I, I think I actually wrote about this for Duke Alumni Magazine once, but that um, being a, or answered some question, that get, having a Duke Law degree made me feel like I could take so many different risks. Um, so I approach a lot of decisions by thinking about the worst thing that could happen. And then if you can survive that, then it's not so bad. So um, that having a Duke Law degree means that the worst thing that can happen is you probably get a pretty good um, job at a medium-sized firm. Like, that's not that bad. And so you actually have this, you actually have this incredible, and I know the market's tough, um, and you may not get paid a lot, but you actually have this incredible cushion that you can fall back on. So when I was deciding to run for governor, I was very concerned about uh, my reputation. Not that anybody knew who I was, but we still have this sort of sense of not wanting to be public I, didn't, I was really concerned about being characterized as a Park Slope liberal um, who was out of touch, uh, ivory tower academic. And I actually was at the, because um, uh, I was really trying to figure out what was the worst thing that can happen. And that's sort of what I came up with, was being a figure of fun, uh, somebody who was mocked, somebody who got a tiny percentage, a narcissist. You know, that was a real concern, um, who runs for office as a narcissist. So I, really going deeply into that and then realizing that that wasn't so bad. So that if, um, you know, a couple million people that I'd never met thought that I was a narcissist, <laughs> it, it actually, there wasn't a great cost to that. I still had my friends. Does that make sense? Actually, also proof that they, that they would have been wrong. <laughs> but I went to the uh, uh, Documentary Film Festival last year when I was deciding because I was approached March 20th. And I went to the, um, you have this great festival here, and I saw this film, The Hand That Feeds, uh, which is about hot and crusty, um, undocumented immigrants organizing on uh, 72nd Street in New York City. 
And I was like, if these guys can risk deportation, I can risk being called a Park Slope liberal. Um, so sort of both putting your own risks in context. And I always find it very relaxing to think of the worst case scenario. That's great. Well, uh, uh, my question, I guess, relates to the United a little bit. And, and in theory, should, I guess in regard to an election or, or a particular piece of legislation, should there be a limit to which an individual, let's just say individual for now, can amplify their voice to advocate for a candidate or for a policy? And if so, what is that limit? So what's, what's your name? Chase. Well, Chase? Yeah, Chase was ask, asking, I think, a similar question. So what should there be a limit? And I guess I'm, I'm going to give him an unsatisfying answer more explicitly. I, I, I think that should be the job of state houses and Congress to figure that out. And I think it's going to change and move. So I can give you one answer in New York State, and I can give you another answer in North Carolina, and I can give you another answer federally. But that I, what I really think is that it should not be the Supreme Court unless there's real evidence that the legislature is doing it to entrench their own interest. It should not be the Supreme Court um, engaging in that. So I think um, that it is a factor to consider entrenchment. That's sort of a, a factor. And it's a factor to consider whether in some meaningful sense this is really limiting the kind of political speech that we all care about. But I think as in most areas of constitutional law, um, there are not, there, there may be language which gives the impression or the sort of, con, you know, the fashion of the last 50 years is to have multi-factor tests that also give this impression of solidity when there is none. Um, not none, but, but I, I'm not going to give you uh, the absolutism that you're looking for. I think that it requires a serious deference to lawmakers with genuine con uh, attention to questions of speech and, um, and uh, in, in, in incumbent entrenchment. Back here. You know, one question that I have, and I suppose has to do more with the question of influence, uh, the question of influence or interest rather than corruption as you've been framing it for primarily as it relates to, primarily as it relates to elections. But a, a great deal of the policy and rules that impact people on a daily basis are made in certain kinds of commissions, uh, and other appointed bodies, and, uh, and it seems to me that the, the questions of whether it's undue corporate interest or uh, a more undue lobbying influence isn't necessarily immediately corrupt, uh, wouldn't necessarily be immediately corru corrected uh, with public financing of campaigns. And I was curious if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, so I should just be very clear that part of the implication of my belief about corruption is that private actors, including those who hire lobbyists, are themselves often the corrupt actors because they're using public power for private ends. Um, and actually, one of the problems with our current structure of our economy is that those who are the heads of companies are often put in an untenable situation where they are both required to try to spend money on changing laws for serving their shareholders and required to not do that for serving their civic interests. So we've actually created, a, I think, an unfortunate tension for a lot of leaders of big companies. Small companies, you don't have the same concerns. Monuts is probably not going to hire lobbyists. Um, so, um, so one is just naming it that and talking about it. Um, second, I think. Um, Therefore, we should be focused on decentralizing economic power, because you're going to see less of this kind of regulatory capture if you have many decentralized economic actors, none of which may themselves have the incentive to get involved. Again, it's not a perfect solution, but it's a partial solution. And then second, I actually think that we should be talking about decentralizing um, power in the government in general and see more uh, localized power. Because um, I made this terrible pun yesterday. Is it a pun? But I'm going to repeat it. Um, it was a watched Paul rarely despoils. <laughs> Instead of a watched terrible. pot, it's terrible? <laughs> OK. <laughs> but basically, that um, I think political activity tends to follow power, not education. And education tends to follow power. 
And so that, that you're going to see a lot more um, engage, engagement and resistance to that kind of regulatory capture the more people feel like they actually have a power to do something different. So that's another reason to decentralize power, because you're closer to the levers of power. Does that make sense? Back in the corner. Hi, speaking of taking risks, um, if somebody here wanted to challenge or represent someone challenging uh, a statute um, based on some sort of corruption-based substantive due process argument, what would be sort of your top two or three statutes that <clears throat> that apply? So I, I think what you're saying is that, uh, if I understand it, um, is that if I am correct that there is a constitutional level pr anti-corruption principle, then there are statutes which themselves violate this anti-corruption principle. I didn't hear you participating in the argument because of, of the corruption underlying, uh, underlying it. Therefore, I'm not bound by or <clears throat> So yeah, I statutes. have decided to not, um, and I actually haven't really thought about this for two or three years, because it's a great question, I've I, but I chose in the book, at least so far, to not argue that the anti-corruption principle was a sword that could be used to strike down statutes, but rather uh, a core principle that justified legislative action around anti-corruption activity, in part because I think it is Actually, I think Justice Marshall, despite being self-interested in that Yazoo case I was talking about, or having a history of self-interest and speculation, was not totally wrong in saying it's really hard for us to say which laws are corrupt in process, and instead we should look to other methods to make it less likely. Your pun was good, by the way. It just okay. took me a little while. Sorry. <laughs> I spoke too soon. A watched pot never boils. Back here. I didn't say never. A watched Paul never despoils. Yeah, in the white and blue. So my name's Chelsea, and I'm a Duke alum, 04, um, and just visiting. Great. Right. Um, so my question has to do with the self-regulation of lawyers and judges. And I think it's a really big topic now that I've been practicing for eight years. Looking back, uh, I kind of see how corruption is intrinsic in our, our system because lawyers are the ones who are corrupt, and <laughs> we regulate ourselves. So I'll provide one example and then see what you think. But first, to answer your question, I would say uh, the rule that allows state, the State Bar of Texas, at least, to transfer all complaints against lawyers and judges, all cases, to itself. So the State Bar, it doesn't matter if it's rape or bribery or any business litigation case. The State Bar of Texas actually has the authority to transfer that case to itself and self-regulate it, seal it, and kind of shut it down. So uh, my example, and this is the last example I'll give, is there's a judge in Dallas right now, a state court judge, Carlos Cortez. And last year, he was heavily funded by Jerry Jones. Uh, in, in Dallas, Jerry Jones funds a bunch of state judges because the Cowboys get in trouble, and they do drugs, and, <laughs> and they there's some domestic violence. There's Typical problems with the Cowboys, so Jerry Jones funds all the judges' campaigns. So this judge was accused of raping six women and an eight-year-old child last year. It was all over the Dallas Morning News, and, it, and all the women have sworn under oath. The child has testified, and they actually knew about some of it before he took the bench. But uh, just the six women in the last year have came forward. And the state bar, through the State Commission on Judicial Conduct, kind of took the complaints out of the prosecutor's office to itself. And then when he wasn't reelected, said, oh, he's not a judge anymore. There's nothing we can do about it. And then the Dallas County District Attorney, who's who I'm, I'm going to have to. <laughs> yeah, have to uh, yeah, we need to come to the point. OK, so, so this my is question terrible, is, but we when, need the question. When you have a system where lawyers and judges regulate themselves and the state commission says, oh, we'll take care of that, and then they, they never do, kind of as an in-house matter, and then the prosecutor is the judge's best friend, then do we have visiting process, visiting prosecutors? Do we limit term limits of judges? What do we do to prevent judicial So I don't know enough about the particular instance, but analyzing that um, power array that you described, what I identified at least is the commission 
which itself could be constituted in a different way. And commissions around the country are increasingly used as, um, and I would say this is true in New York, but as, as extensions of the executive branch and um, as opposed to as um, responsive to the public and figuring out ways to do citizen elections for commissions, which they've done around some, um, uh, both in energy and other areas, I think is one way to look at a structural way. So there's a structural check without looking at the particular um, instance. One more back here. You had your hand up a minute ago. about you're pointing to sort of difficulties with sort of divining the intentions of for example a legislator a legislator who's voting and, and it's difficult to understand what their motivations were probably true to say that in many instances they have many motivations for casting a single vote but I, I have to ask if we take it from the perspective of a person who's making a contribution is that is the same as true I, I can think of many instances where you can, you can say that particularly coming from a corporation who is often by definition the person, you know, the person making the decision to make a contribution is by definition unable to consider um, the well-being of the general public in making, this, in making a, this position or making this decision rather than the corporation itself. Like is it so, tr so difficult to divine when a corporation is essentially trying to what might constitute a bribe? You know, it's a, it's a great question. So bribery law, and I, I uh, uh, Sarah Sun Beale is gone, so I, my old professor might not correct me. <laughs> but bribery law is basically giving a thing of value with intent to influence official action. Um, so since the 70s, many people have written that most campaign contributions are bribes under that basic model. The courts since the 70s have said there is an exception in campaign contributions for our general bribery statute. Because if there were not an exception, every campaign contribution would basically be susceptible to being uh, prosecuted. That it's impractical to do it any other way. And so we've taken a big exception that you need some kind of explicit quid pro quo. Um, and I don't know that the courts are wrong to do that given that we have a private financing system. Because in any given case, you're going to find um, the, the plausibility of an indictment. And that's, I think, somewhat threatening. I think that we, as a public, are wrong to not build a, a public financing system. That the courts were sort of making what they could, saying there's an incompatibility between our bribery statutes and our private financing system statutes. Therefore, the bribery, bribery statutes might, must fall. Now, maybe it would have been interesting if they'd said the opposite. like. There's no incompatibility. Bring it all to court. Maybe that would have forced a move to a public financing system uh, quicker. But does that make sense? It's because I think you're right, and therefore the courts had to say, we can't prosecute everything here. <clears throat> um, let me just tell a very, very brief story about Zephyr Teachout as we conclude. That's what I was worried about. Captures some of the, <laughs> We're very good friends. <laughs> of the spirit of the extraordinary trajectory she's been on over the last 10 years. When Zephyr was down here full time a few years ago, I asked her once what she had done over the weekend. And she said, I was running. I went running. And I decided to close my eyes and see how many steps I could take with no idea where I was going to come down. And I took two and three. And then I opened my eyes. And then I did it again. And I took five, six, seven, and opened my eyes again. And I got to 14. And I was still running with my eyes closed. Not far past 14. Knowing where, maybe you got to 21. I was trying to remember this morning. I didn't want to exaggerate. I think you can finish the thought for yourself. In a sense, she's been doing exactly that ever since. Let's thank Zephyr for coming thank to talk Jeff. to us today. Thank you.